so congrats i suppose first of all on your uh your i guess your new recruits um your your new responsibilities taking over the the role of uh liaison with the affiliates here in ireland we'll go on to that a little bit later on um i guess the last couple of weeks you've probably had a shit ton of meetings and zoom calls and uh extra draws on your uh on your energy sources so are, are you fond of coffee to replenish those energy sources am i what sorry fond, of coffee, fond of coffee yeah i am indeed yeah yeah um is there you're in i do you live in bath yeah is there much it strikes me as a type of place where there'd be a, a fairly hipstery coffee scene oh it's very pretentious and sort of um yeah great great coffee digs actually so yeah we're quite quite fortunate in that regard um and is that like do you i know a lot of people kind of um embrace the ritual of making coffee like as you know like just part of their day or whatever is that something you're interested in or is it more so like just fuel and it happens to taste nice um no i certainly i think you know i'm um when we had the first lockdown back in march last year obviously you're at home and you've got a lot more time on your hands so you know the act of making coffee definitely became something that you actually look forward to and uh, it's a bit of a ritual to be honest, I, I was sick of, I, I actually got frustrated with having to, you know, do a pour over coffee or make a cafetiere all the time. And so I bought one of those um, Sage um, coffee oh, machines. Barista, yeah, yeah. I, heard you, I heard you mention it in a previous podcast. So I got one of those and I love it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's funny, it, it sounds ridiculous, but I go to bed and I look forward to, that doesn't sound ridiculous at all. Getting coffee in the morning, basically. You're you're preaching the converted here. That doesn't sound <laughs> ridiculous at all. Um, it, have you have you attempted like latte art or anything? I've attempted it, failed miserably, and every now and then I think, oh no, I'll give it another go, and then I just think, nah, stop this. I haven't got the time and the patience. Yeah. To do I'd love to look up the 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 chemistry of it, but like we get um we do a weekly shop in Aldi, like you know, um, and we get like uh, our daughter has moved on to like cow's milk for her bottle so we get like you know those big fuck off three liter like it's like a drum of milk um but i couldn't the last like five days i've my latte art has just gone to shite and i was not particularly good anyway but it's really gone to shit and it's so disappointing because you're pouring for a while and you're like okay here we go now pressure's on like it's like you know this is don't fuck this up you're not wasting this coffee start pouring it's like ah oh, it didn't work and it just kept happening i couldn't figure it out and then we got i got different milk and um, just swang by a shop to get milk today um worked perfectly and i was looking at the back and the only difference i can see i assumed the higher the fat in the milk the easier it would like the more like creamier it would go or whatever but uh, i looked at the back Very and it was like eight grams versus nine grams and i was like oh it's actually lower so it doesn't make so i still don't understand it and it might be just a coincidence or like some kind of um what would you call it like a placebo where i see the label and i think oh i'll do like you know subconsciously i'm more gamey for it or something i don't know no semi semi skimmed milk is much easier to froth and do uh do uh the, no, the normal milk yeah 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 for sure because we usually always get full fat but the odd occasion when we've got semi-skimmed i've like pawn it and i've almost done it by accident, I've done like it. Up by accident. <laughs> oh shit and I, I was like damn that was a wasted opportunity i could have nailed it then so yeah yeah my like yeah if, if i if i realize halfway through that it's working it just ends up with cock and balls like yeah. every time <laughs> exactly. um Perfect. yeah yeah you know, balls you obviously travel a lot um, with your different roles and stuff and, you know, you'd be around the UK a good bit. Um, like, do you listen to podcasts when you're traveling around or like, have you much of an interest in them outside of recording them, I guess? Yeah, no, definitely. I, I, I guess it goes in waves for me and, and I don't know why I haven't put my finger on it. It's a little bit like seasons. I'll go for a period where I'll go right deep into podcasts and then I'll go to, I'll flip to audio books and then I'll go back to podcasts and I kind of go back and forth really. Um, at the moment I'm listening to an audio book um, called Troy by, it's like the, the story of Troy by Stephen Fry. It's brilliant. He offers it as well. So, um, so I'm getting into that, but yeah, usually, um, and then it's different podca podcasts, right? So I love long form Joe Rogan style, like really deep dive into conversation podcasts. 
Um, but sometimes I just want to wax something on for half an hour and it might be, you know, a CrossFit specific one, you know, coffee pod and what, or, <laughs> um, you know, talking elite fitness or something like that, or, or you know, and actually usually it's because it's around a certain topic that I probably need to have some understanding of or get people's perspective, What try and understand what people's perspective is around a certain topic, particularly in CrossFit. So there's a bit of research there as well. Um, it, it, yeah, it's, a, it's a mixture of everything, really. It's interesting, though, as well, like the sport. It's something that I've always kind of noticed is that, like, you know, CrossFit has kind of uh, historically always played its cards very close to its chest. Like, it doesn't give away a lot of stuff. So it kind of lends itself to rumors and it lends itself to speculation, which in turn like gives opportunities for people like sean and tommy or you know arm and hammer to be like oh i wonder if the fact that they said this means this like do you think that that's like a a useful tool for crossfit to have in that like if they're kind of aloof a bit it publicizes themselves without needing to actually do anything because these external media sources will talk about stuff like there's countless you know, people making YouTube videos of like, apparently this is happening and apparently this, whatever. And then you've got like people getting guests on talking about stuff that might or might not happen or has been alluded to or cha- possible. Like Morning Chalk Up must get like four out of five of their daily uh, newsletters is apparently this might happen. Do you know, like, so <laughs> it, it's, it's very useful for CrossFit being as aloof as they are because they can kind of, leak something to Morning Chalk Up, like, oh, apparently we're switching away from regionals to sanctionals, and then let them put it out, see what the reaction is, and then pull the plug and it be like, oh, shit, no, that got a really bad reaction. You better not do that. <laughs> yeah, that's a really, that's, I've not thought about that. That's a good idea. Like, pressure test it. Like, yeah. you pressure test it. Ah, oh, yeah, no, we're not doing that. No yeah. point who who said that? I don't know where that came from. Um, oh, well, I guess it's a double edged sword, isn't it, really? It's, uh, yeah, it, it does um, create talking points and, um creates this kind of environment where people are speculating and stuff so i, I guess that's it's good in some ways gives gives some talking points it'd be very boring if it was very rigid and structured and everyone mm. knew what was going on but in the, i guess in the uh, the other side of that is it feels a bit of a vacuum it uh, creates a bit of a vacuum where crossfit can lose a narrative to a certain degree mm. and the influence and so that's definitely something that's happened in the past as well yeah. where they lose control over, you know, I don't know, do you watch, do you ever watch the US office? <laughs> but it's, <laughs> um, you know, there's there's a, a scandal with a, a watermark and Michael Scott calls a, a press conference and he's like, you know, you're going to tell the press about it. And then he goes like, well, they're not going to find out about it on their own. <laughs> you know, like he's planning on <laughs> announcing this like mistake. So I think, yeah, you can, you can go too far with it. But uh, when you're, when you're listening to your podcast then, like what, what, what is it that brings you back for a second episode so say like i guess the the unique draw of joe rogan is the guests or the caliber of guests that he gets and that it's you know like wide ranging you could have like a you know robert downey jr one week and then like some doctor that works in a really high pressure environment the next week like so it, it's a it's a unique scope i guess but is there is there certain things you look for or maybe looking at it now that you think like god oh, i never thought about it actually but these qualities are things that i admire in a show you yeah, know, great question. I think I usually I, I will look, I will scan the guests and see if there's something I, I've got like some interest in there. Um, but what I found is really interesting, and usually I look for one that's really long as well, because I know they, they get really deep into the conversation. If it's a Joe Rogan and it's like an hour and a half, then I think, okay, well, it's just somebody plugging a book or something like that. There's a, there's a motive there. And um, you know, Joe's let's guard down and let someone come in and, and plug something because that's usually not his style. Um, but what I found really interesting is that you know you you'll go through you'll go through them and you'll you'll like oh, I'll put that one off. I'm not really interested in that one. No, I'll put that one off. I won't listen to that one. And then you run out of you've like well I've listened to more and you come back to those ones that you think you'd never have any interest in. And you think ah oh, that was fascinating. I really enjoyed that. And actually they're the ones that I find the most interesting. So I'm kind of trying to double guess myself now where I think. No, I definitely won't listen to that. So I'm gonna to listen to it basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I um I listen to when I go to sleep. Oh really? Um to uh stuff you should know. So it's just like brain floss basically because it's not like sometimes it catches me out like that where I think like I'm not gonna have any interest in this, I'll be asleep in five minutes. And then I start listening to it, I'm like, fuck, I never thought of that before. I was listening to one last night and it was like 
um, you know, the Michelin star restaurant guide is the same company that does the tires. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's a bit weird. I was like, what the fuck uh, has a tire company got to do? But they started it in like, oh shit, like 1900 or something. And they started it to encourage people to drive further so they'd wear their tires down so they'd buy more tires of the Michelin Tire Company, which mm-hmm. is like, I mean, that's the longest thinking. <laughs> like, it's so outside the box. Like, yeah. but yeah, it's genius. And the same parameters or the same, uh, you know, uh, star system is the same that it was then. So like three stars means, uh, I think the line is something like, it worth a special journey so it's still like you know go and, go and drive somewhere like but yeah no like so i ended up just staying awake for an extra half hour because i was like fuck that's crazy like how clever were those guys to think of that like way back then but um yeah you've appeared um you've appeared in a few podcasts especially recently um is that like is that something that you enjoy doing is it something that you see maybe as like that there's an onus on you to do it that you hold like a role now that requires you to 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 fulfill those responsibilities maybe um and that if you're putting your face out there then i guess like crossfit bath will benefit crossfit itself will benefit and like strength and death will benefit or is it something that you just love doing and you could give two shits about who benefits from it yeah no again good question i think with the um i do enjoy it it's a good for forum for me you know it's um I, i'm not great at writing and and just speaking having informal conversations is much easier for me um and it and actually i'm not i'm not the most literate person in the world i'm not the most well-spoken person in the world so it's really good practice for me as well so selfishly that's i guess the one selfish kind of motive for me that just helps me with, with kind of i guess public speaking to a certain mm. degree um but you know really i do feel obligated to i guess share the crossfit message in a in a, in a, on, a on a local level basically and we, we're quite hot at the moment we're just trying to um connect with people one-to-one one person at a time basically and uh you know i think from crossfit's perspective it, it is valuable that i do try and be as present as possible in the community and purely just to for people to know that we we give a shit and that there are people in the in the communities on the ground trying to make a difference because um, mm. i should imagine majority of your listeners wouldn't even know that we, there were country managers or was a country manager in the uk in, and in ireland now so um so it's partly that i mean there's no there's no zero advantage for strength and depth i, I don't think anyway um we have our own podcast at crossfit bath which is again a great um, platform for me to just get information out to the members and it's broadly designed for the members um, but we do get a variety of different guests on there and Jason who runs that's been awesome um, I always wanted to do one but I never really had the 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 time and the aptitude to be able to run it and actually deliver it and pull it together whereas he loves that stuff and he's great at it so I just turn up talk shit for an hour and then you know it's, it's perfect for me so yeah um, so yeah, hopefully I answer you. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned Bath there. So you're a co-founder and owner there. Like, at what point post, we'll say, discovering CrossFit, did it become a goal or, like, you know, a realistic possibility to open your own affiliate? Um, so we, so I found CrossFit in a, I think it was, two, it's either 2007, late 2007, early 2008. Um, and we're just researching different training methodologies. Uh, I came from a rugby background, so the the old beach weights and long, slow cardio didn't really resonate with me, to be honest. Uh, and I was very fortunate to, have, fortunate to have some good strength and conditioning coaches that taught me how to do weightlifting and back squats and the, the powerlifting, etc. cetera. Um, and so did some research, found Jim Jones actually before crossfit realized actually jim jones is saying they're doing their own thing but it's actually crossfit um and then started doing that in our own training uh and it was pretty quickly like pretty soon after that we were like yeah we want to open our affiliate and it, at the time it wasn't really like a business proposition it was it was more a like, we're we're proud of doing crossfit and we want to share the methodology with our friends and family uh, we've got a little 500 square foot 
kind of unit, which are, are we talking like steel and concrete, basically? Correct. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like no matting on the floor, a, um, literally scaffolding pole for a pull up bar, one bar, one rower. Um, so yeah, it was, it was proper bare minimal and, um, but it was great. We made it work and, you know, it grew fairly organically. So you managed it cause you had one person, you might have two people turn up and they're friends of yours. So it's, it's, you're just hanging out and just, and we were really learning as, as CrossFit coaches as well, because I had a strength and conditioning background and the guys I opened the gym with were personal trainers, but we'd never been into the detail of like, and the virtuosity that a, a CrossFit coach eventually mm. develops over time so um it was a great kind of um it was like a school of hard, hard knocks basically just learning in, on the fly and uh yeah winging it to a certain degree do you um, remember then when you changed like from steel and concrete and scaffold poles like do you remember getting like an actual rig and getting like equipment was there a thing of like oh shit we better take this really seriously now <laughs> No, I don't. I don't think we ever had that realization that we should take it seriously. <laughs> Not waiting for that, to be honest. Um, but no, it it was. Um, yeah, I do remember getting our first proper rig. It was it was by a company called Beaverfit, who uh, um, they actually built bridges back in the day. And now they now they're pretty huge. They've got massive contracts with the U.S. Army and stuff, and they yeah. they build some some brilliant stuff. Um, but yeah, I remember it turning up and the. The lad called, we called, I don't know why, we, I think his nickname was Goose. It was a young lad. He must have been like 16, 17, helped us set it up. And he was showing us all these, like the, the cool thing to do is have like this wing that came off and it had multiple pull-up bars on it. And you could do what we used to call frying, uh, flying fran, where you do oh, yeah, yeah. and then jump to the bar. Completely impractical, <laughs> like massive amount of steel and cost. Uh, just that one little gimmicky thing but I can remember being so proud of it and uh, yeah that was uh, that was like we've made it now we, we, we've reached a big time but that was like literally it was like six months after opening up our first little yeah. it went mental it was, it was crazy so you, you talk about you know making it the big time you're, you're at regionals three times um, on it where did you get your info from where did you, <laughs> where did you take this up I, like what are your memories of those and i, I suppose like a, a, a follow-up to that like how, did that uh the experience of doing that and attending an event like that and being part of an event like that did that f- maybe um taint is the wrong word inspire your uh strength and depth having like been a part of something like that yeah 100 percent. i think um so i so i went to regionals i think it was 2011 maybe 11 12, 11 12 and 13 i have yeah, 11 so that was like the first year of the open yeah um before so the year before that there was what they called sectionals yeah so you just rock up and we did it like in a field in, in, it was supposed to be in a naval base no it was supposed to be an raf base up in the uh midlands in the uk in, the, in the england and they couldn't get security clearance for us to get onto the base. So they were like, oh, yeah, sorry, we're going to do it in this park over here now under a, a marquee. And I remember, like, there's a, the, I was judging. I just had a knee operation, so I wasn't competing. I was judging. And there was a guy doing GHD sit-ups, and the GHD just fell in half. <laughs> I was like, he was kind of looking at me like, what's like, that? no ref. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, we've got two people, like, holding it together yeah. while he's trying to do his GHD. You just, he's, like, lying on the ground confused, and you just do that classic, like, hand swipe <laughs> gesture. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was a period of time where you did have quite a few judges doing that. They just, like, yeah. you know, like, you, you clearly didn't, like, someone would do, like, someone would, like, jump on the bar and then fall down again. Yeah, yeah. You didn't even try and pull up, and they're like, like, I've seen that though, and it's like you're so it's like, come on, man, you didn't need to do that. Like someone yeah. trying to snatch and they just deadlift it and then shave their head, and the judge is like, oh, that's a no ref there. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so um, so yeah, it was sectionals. You just you just rocked up, it was like sign your name up and, and rock up, and then you go to regionals. So the regionals was in Sweden that year, at, um, Aliko headquarters. The year before that. The regionals was literally just turn up, and there were sixteen people in Northern Ireland, uh, cross at Northern Ireland, the original cross at Northern Ireland back in the back in the day, and um, yeah, it was like literally turn up, sixteen people, um, one girl, fifteen blokes, 
and it was just bizarre. And then that, that's how you qualify for the games, basically. Just uh, it was it was crazy. And uh, the poor girl that was competing that year, she all you had to do was one handstand push up, and you'd qualify. So she had no competition. So providing she did this handstand push up, she was it. She couldn't do a handstand push up. She tried and tried and tried. I was like devastated for her. Maybe um, it was best that she stopped at that point, though, rather than going <laughs> to the games and the yeah. event won like yeah. 21 handstand push ups. Oh, crap. But we were there. I remember we rocked up on the Friday. Again, I wasn't completing, but Adam, who I, I run the gym with, he was he was pretty decent back in the day. Um, we uh, Miko Salo rocked up. And uh, we were chatting to him and exchanging pleasantries. And, and I remember he literally signed up like three days before. It was like on an old school like forum. And he was like, oh, there's still spaces. And Kempi was organized. I was like, yeah, come along, like literally three days before. Um, and uh, we were chatting to him and he walked off. And then Shax, Adam, who, who I run the gym, he looked at me and goes, yeah, I could take him. Like, next thing you know, we're doing heavy Helen. He's literally finished a round before anyone else. And he's, he's, he literally finishes the workout, picks up his camera and starts taking pictures of everyone. And everyone's like what? still on, like doing this workout. Everyone's like on the floor, like dying, like splaying on over. People have been sick. He's literally like just there, like completely stoic, taking pictures. I always thought the worst thing you could do after a workout is start tidying up your gear when other people are still training. <laughs> Taking photographs of people still training or still working out is so much worse. I remember all the Americans were like, no chance, it's impossible. You know, <laughs> they must be doing, they must be cheating or they didn't get the, you know, the standards right in, in Europe. Like, but no, he is that good. And, and yeah, then he went yeah. on to win the game. So, um, but yeah, no, so sorry, I digress. Um, I think what, what was good, um, what, what what seeing the evolution of of the sport and how they ran regionals over the years gave me a real insight into how they refined the processes and the, and the professionalism of, of of the events and so when we started doing our own events it was it was I, I literally just ripped off everything they did and I could and I constantly you know because I also was competing I managed to get an athlete experience so I could understand what that process looked like and and um you know replicate it in our own events so it was very mm. that was kind of the most um advantageous i guess thing of, of of competing so what's um what's your training like now because obviously you've got more kind of draws on your energies with different stuff that you have to do like day in day out so you've, you've maybe gone full circle from the first while in CrossFit bath of like fuck it let's just hang out for the day and train whenever we want and eat food in between or whatever to now you've got a family you've got different jobs you've got different roles of responsibility like has it you know are, are you now kind of squeezing in training where and when you can or is it still something that you religiously make sure you have time for every day well it is I'm squeezing it in but it's also something that I make sure I have time to do basically hmm. so, um, I'm not really that bothered about progressing improving if i work out that day and i get a good quality workout in i'm happy like i'm delighted with that basically it's liberating when you get there though isn't it like it's a liberating feeling to be like to not obsess over numbers or not obsess over you know like oh why is that slower than what you know like to it's it's liberating to just be like oh, i moved today and that was good yeah for sure and, and then you know let's be honest when i was when i went to regionals there was about 50 people in the whole of Europe doing CrossFit. So it wasn't like I was like this super athlete. I can say I went to regionals, but the re reality was the standards were nowhere near what they are now. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, and I, 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 I try and keep as close to, um, you know, the methodology as possible, really free on one off. Um, you know, if I give you an example, the last three days, I went for a long hour run on the Sunday, and I did like a partner workout with my wife on Monday, just uh, like an interval style with rowing and med ball cleans and, and um, burpees. And then what did I do yesterday? Yesterday I did like a pump session. So I did dumbbell rows and um, shoulder press and curls and that type of stuff. So I try and keep it as varied as possible. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's actually, I actually find in lockdown, I find it easier because I'm not traveling as much. I'm mm. not, I, I do, although... I'm more mentally taxed because we have lots of Zoom calls and, and lots of meetings and I'm sat at a desk a lot more. Um, but I do 
feel like I have more time to get that that training in. So, um, and usually it's only you know half an hour at the most. I'm quite I'm quite happy to just do a few arm circles, hit it, and then you know crack on, spend the rest of the evening with my kids and my wife. So, um, mm. yeah. Where um where did the impetus for strength and depth come from? So like, is it did you guys? Do you think he spotted a gap in the market or did, did you spot an opportunity or was it more like a, a challenge for yourselves to set something up? Yeah, I had, so I had, um, so, you know, one of the benefits of the box is we have some super cool, bright, talented people there. And I was just having a beer with one of the members one afternoon um, and we were just talking about CrossFit Bath. And, and at the time we'd, you know, we were, we were the fittest UK box consistently for a couple of years um and you know before instagram was really a thing and this is what literally was before instagram we were quite prevalent on, on you know on social media and stuff because we pure only purely because we've been successful at competitions and we'd had multiple people going to regionals and and a lot of that was just because we were i guess early adopters and found it relatively early so we had a couple of years under our belt of, of training and, and experience uh, so um so yeah we 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 were having a chat and he was like, look, you guys have got a great brand. You should do something about it. And he was an ex Marine officer and then an angel. He, he kind of uh, built and sold his business for a decent chunk of change. And he, he's a bit of an angel vest, investor now. Um, and he was like, you should do something. We should, we should try and come up with something, you know, leverage CrossFit Bath and its success. And um, I was like, well, funny you should say that because we were going to competitions and where most boxers would have, like our team, we'd literally turn up like four or five teams. Like everyone in the box would come and compete. And there's a there's a really cool, amazing uh, competition called Divided We Fall, which is way ahead of their the curve at the time. They were kind of a big team competition again in the UK. And um, so we'd go to there, and we'd have like all these teams. And I I was always thinking, wouldn't it be really cool if we could just pull all these teams together? Like we we literally have like a real strength and depth at the box. Um, and I'd love to like create a competition where it, it's not just the top two or three people in your gym that compete at a quality competition. It's like it's it's like those people that are just a layer below that, you know, never quite get to go to real quality premium competition. Um, and that's kind of where the concept came from. And that's where the idea came from. And ironically, first couple of years, I said CrossFit Bath couldn't compete. I was like, no, we're not competing. It's conflict of interest. Um, you know, and also I needed them to volunteer at the end of the day. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where it came from basically, purely just because, you know, we were doing all right as, as a gym and I, I felt like, you know, I've had a rugby background, so it never really felt, I was on teams of like fours and six, and it never really felt like a team, um, whereas 12 people felt like a, you know, a proper team. Mm. And then Don, Don, the guy I, I set it up with, he was a master. So he was like, Adam, you've got to have a master in there as well. So I was like, yeah, cool. Awesome. We'll have. Male and, male and female masters have a mixture of uh, males and females as well um, and it'd be a real representation of the of the box rather than just the top one or two people at the gym mm. when um when sanctions were announced and the the move away from from regionals seemed to be the preferred route was there a point where you guys saw becoming a sanctional as a realistic possibility and like wh- like what was the process uh in like to attaining that like yeah well it wasn't really a process if i'm honest um it's basically the um we were we were just referred as a candidate in the uk i guess and i exchanged a few emails with jeff kane who's the previous ceo of crossfit um and he was like look we'd love to get you on a call tonight or or some tomorrow which was like sort of saturday and he said can you get on a call tomorrow night sunday night about 11 o'clock 11 p.m. it was so I was like yeah absolutely like not going to say no about that no to that and I, I didn't really have a plan it was like we'll just say yes and then figure it out afterwards basically I've um, been there <laughs> yeah was, I spoke to him and um he was like oh, I've got Greg on the phone I was like shit okay all right um and then Greg kind of spoke for literally like 10-15 minutes talked about the changes of the season you know why he was doing it etc and then he just said, and you know, do you want to be a part of it? We'd love to have you on board. I was like, 
uh, 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 yeah, yeah, sure, of course, no problem. And I'd wrote like loads of notes expecting to like yeah, yeah. pitch myself over the phone and introduce, uh, I didn't have to do any of that really. It was just so informal, um, which, was, which was, was obviously amazing and a great opportunity for us, but in hindsight, probably should have been a bit more due diligence and a, a bit more of a screening process than just the, the phone call. But um, so yeah, that's kind of how it, it worked out really. And then we, well, that was kind of in October and we were penciled in to be in February. And so we were kind of like, we had, a, we had our, our origins event happen in November, like the month afterwards. So we're like, well, there's no way we can deliver that and then deliver a sanctional event in February. And then after a couple of days of reflection, we were like, you know, what, it'd just be, it, it's too good an opportunity to just delay it 18 months. Let's just do it. Let's, yeah, it's going to be stressful. It's going to be hard. But, you know, if we do it well, it will, it will pay off. And, um, you know, we were just proud to represent the UK as well. We thought, you know, we, we'd be doing a disservice waiting 18 months before we do a sanction event. So, so yeah, by hook or by crook, we, we managed to pull it together in, in the first sanction event in um, about four months. And uh, it did almost kill us, but, you know, I'm glad we did it. I've got no regrets whatsoever. Yeah, in like in 2020, you had a pretty fucking ridiculous field uh, in the event. So like, you know, Matt Fraser was there and Laura Hovart and Zach George and Freedom were there. And mm -hmm. like, there's obviously nerves before hosting any event, like where you want things to work out well and you want things to go smoothly. Like, you know, do they get dialed up? a bit when you start seeing like such household names are going to be there and you're like oh shit like you know it's kind of I, re I really wanted it to go well when it was like x y and z but now it really has to go well yeah no i think um certainly for my wife meg so Me meg and my wife she she she's kind of i come up with the stupid ideas and the far-fetched kind of you know vision of it and then she's the one that actually pulls it together which is <laughs> such attention to detail um, and she, 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 she's got a first class honours degree in event management. So she, she ran events previously. So, um, so she, she's experienced and she's a professional in this, but she is, she cares so deeply that everything is, goes well and is, you know, the best that we possibly can be. So she, she, she finds it incredibly stressful. Um, whereas I'm kind of like, it is what it is. Like, we'll do our best. We'll put our, our blood, sweat and tears into it, but you know, if people don't like it, then, you know, we, we, as long as we can say we've done our best and we, we've tried our best. And, and for me, it's all about just delivering experiences. It's just trying to create, um, you know, an experience and a memory for people that, that will last a lifetime. Because I'm a big believer that possessions are, you know, temporary, whereas memories are, will, will, will stay with you forever. And that's what, it, that, that's what motivates me running events, because it's, it's, it's hard work and it's it's hard graft. There's definitely easier ways of, of, of making a living and uh, if you can even make a living from running events. Um, but yeah, no, I don't, I didn't, I guess I don't feel, um, I, I definitely didn't feel more pressure. I, if, if anything, it was just more pride that we could deliver an experience of that many people. Mm. Um, and, and I'm confident in, it, it's not me, like I don't, I, I kind of, um, I can be the face of it, but really we have such an amazing team that pull the whole thing together. And I've got so much trust and faith in them that they're going to do a good job that I, I'm, I, I don't I don't worry about it too much, if that makes mm. sense. Um, it was interesting. Yeah. I, I spoke to uh, Jamie from, uh, from Filthy and uh, like, I kind of, it actually didn't come up in the interview, but I, I was at an event with him after that. And, he was talking to there was a group of us there and he was talking about an event and he was like the athlete comes first like he was like that's your focus is that the athlete enjoys it has a smooth weekend there's no hiccups there's no like oh shit we're running late or or whatever and it's it's funny because i suppose like as a spectator you kind of assume that the spectator comes first you can kind of assume that the which which I suppose speaks to how well the event is ran. If it feels for the spectator like they're the the priority, mm -hmm. it's obviously being run really well. Mm -hmm. But I just thought it was very uh, interesting that like the athlete comes first before everything, and then after that, it's the spectator and the spectacle itself. I guess um, because I suppose it's it's easy to assume like right, you're, you the athletes, you're the talent. Like you just show up and do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it. And it's all about those guys that are paying to be here or whatever. Like, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, a it's interesting. I thought that, you know, it's not as straightforward as 
you know, even a football match, like if you go watch a football match, like, you know, they could give two shits about how much the footballers enjoy it. Like they want the spectators shouting, they want them spending their money and they want them coming back the next week doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it's, it's even more difficult for an event where you might only have an event every every 12, 18 months or whatever to get that call back to, well, remember how much you enjoyed it last time and you need those athletes to enjoy it. Like you need Matt Fraser to enjoy it. So he yeah. posts about it and talks about it and wants to come back, you know? Yeah, for sure. No, And, and Jamie's bang on. It, 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 because if athletes don't have a great experience, they're not going to want to come back. And I know, you you know, you, and you can't, with events as well, you can't just think singly one year at a time. You have to think, well, what we do this year is going to help us build on next year. Mm. You constantly kind of reinvest in for the, for the future. And if you, if your programming is not bang on and you're not creating a self environment and a professional environment and they feel protected from the, from the fans, etc., then they're not going to want to come back. And I think that's, that was the biggest, um, I think being able to do that first sanctional in 2019, get that out, demonstrate to kind of a wider the wider kind of community that we can run professional events and you know if we do you know deliver a good experience for the athletes that kind of that word got round and i think that's how we managed to get those guys this mm -hmm. year because they, they they were looking at all the events and it was a bit real mixed bag let's be honest um and i think well at least if we go to london we know that we'll be looked after we'll be protected and it'll be a good test it's not going to be ridiculous and we're not going to do 15 workouts over like 10 days or whatever um, did you program the event yourself yeah i did yeah your strength and depth was the only event that i heard castro mention like well he didn't mention my name because he just wouldn't but he said uh someone's someone asked him something about like oh how invested are you in the sanctionals and you know how whatever he's like i haven't watched any i haven't looked at any the only um the only information i have is that it was obviously you um called him and said or oh, thinking of doing like a real like boat event what would you think and he was like oh, i said it was a bad idea and then like the conversation moved on like you obviously had like your ducks in a row ready to ready to go somewhat on that event so then when you talk to him and say like well, what would you think about doing this and he's like i wouldn't do it are you like oh shit maybe i won't do it now or does it light a fire in you to be like well fuck him i'll prove him wrong yeah, no, to be honest, um, I guess the story of that is, so I'm a good friend with a guy called Cameron Nickel, and he's been a great advocate for CrossFit and rowing. He, he, was, um, he was a GB rower and uh, um, rode at the Olympics. Amazing guy, super cool. He's a, he's a, he's a um, GP, he's a doctor as well. So he's in the firing line at the moment. So I've not spoken to him a lot recently. Obviously, he's passionate about rowing and getting rowing to a broader kind of demographic and CrossFit's great at that, isn't it? Popularizing certain sports like weightlifting, et cetera. And so he was like, what do you think about rowing at Sid? And I was like, I love the idea. I want to challenge ourselves, and, but I don't want it to be gimmicky. I don't yeah. want it to be something that is just a, hey, look, this is cool. Like, and that was the last thing I wanted. So I said, if we're going to do it, it has to be a credible test. It has to be something that you know, you don't have a huge amount of advantage if you've, you've had that much experience. Inevitably, it's the same as like a gymnast is going to be more, is going to be better at walking on their hands, right? That's just inevitable. Yeah. Um, but just, you know, don't make it so, so niche that, you know, you've got people falling in and it just is a bit of a shit show, basically. So we, tr we he was like, don't worry about that. I've got some plans. I've got some ideas. And we talked about loads of different things. And obviously I've got no experience in rowing. So I hadn't, I didn't know where to start. And he was like, look, we need to get wider boats because the single skulls are very narrow and you do, you know, fall in. And um, he's like, we get, we get, a, if we can get um, an, an experienced rower in the boat, that can just be a bit of a safety net just in case the rowers just go completely off, mm. off track or off course. Um, and there was loads of little nuance. I was like, well, what about the weight? Like, he's like, yeah, we'll put some weights in and stuff. So, so I kind of came up with all the issues and he came up with all the solutions. So I can't take a huge amount of credit for it, but I just tried to make it, you know, back to Jamie's point, you've got to put the athlete first and it has to be an authentic test. Otherwise you lose them. You just, um, you, you know, you're not going to get the buy-in from them. Hmm. So anyway, so we did this idea and actually Cam was the one, I wouldn't dare just email Dave and go, Hey, what do you think? Cameron was the one that I think he'd exchanged some emails before because his rowing course was going to be, part of the training um, yeah. curriculum, et cetera. So yeah, he emailed him and Dave was like, yeah, not, don't think it's a good idea. Um, 
And uh, he was like, oh, damn, what do you think? I was like, well, let's just do it. Like, I think, you know, it, it, I, I, I believe in you and you've put a lot, I mean, part of the, I, I was kind of, and I'll be honest, I was kind of 50-50 with it. But he was so passionate about it. And he just, he had just had everything covered, like from, from start to finish. I was like, you know what, we've, we've put too much effort in it and it is a, is a cool thing and it's a good mm. test. And, you know, using the water in January is not much flexibility, right? There's not many things we can do. Um, and then there was obviously loads of tie-ins with um, GB rowing and there was loads of support from, from the boat company and all that sort of stuff. So we're like, Let, let's just do it. Um, we put it out there very early as well. So athletes knew, so it wasn't like, hey, hey, surprise. It was like, we gave them like three months notice to get prepared this is the setup. This is what it's going to look like. Get practicing now, basically. Um, and because of all those things, I felt confident that we mm. could we could deliver it and we could do it. Um, so yeah, some, no, that's, so that's how it works. Right? Get, so if you turn, it'd be some land to get if you turned up at an event and they're just handing you an oar and we're like, surprise, yeah. event three. You're like, what? Because yeah. because um, when when Fraser heard that, because Fraser said he was going to come in December, and when he heard it was rowing, he was like, I. I, I I've rowed before and it was not easy. Like, you know, it was challenging, but because the boats were wider, there was two people and that kind of. Elated you know, fears kind of, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, so yeah, no, Dave didn't, didn't like the idea. Probably he's going to bite us in the ass now. So he was like, <laughs> well, that, those guys who defied me, yeah, they're not going to be a semi-final. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, like, was it a tough pill to swallow then when the changes were announced again, that it was changing away from sanctions back to, the more kind of regionals like continental style or whatever was it like oh for fuck's sake like we just established ourselves yeah yeah no it, it, it was frustrating but but i completely get it and i understand it and i think it for me personally like if i was a complete neutral i think it's it's the best thing for the sport um and i think it's the right thing to do to make sure events now go through a full due diligence process and hmm. you know, they're, they're picked standardized on, they're, i guess yeah then and they're not picked on you know they're not you know, they're, they're, not, picked they're, not picked, they're not picked over a phone call with the yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah precisely exactly so uh, um, have so, yeah, you was... have you applied for semi like do you, what's the process there is there a, like i saw someone i can't remember who it was but someone put up something on they were doing an ask me anything on their stories the other day and someone said oh someone asked like do you hope fuck i can't remember who it was but they're like do you hope such and such an event will be a semi-final and the response was well i fucking hope at the end of january that they already know who the semi-finalists are like is there an open door for applications there or is that closed long ago has it already been decided where they're going to be and who's going to host them yeah i uh basically uh, i'll be careful to make sure that i get this right but basically there was there was a deadline until the 4th of January to get your application in. And I think there was over 30 applicants of events, whether, you know, previous sanctional events, but other events as well. You know, there were, there were some really quality um, events out there that weren't a sanctional event. Um, and so I think they had about 30 applicants and they are going through that due diligence process now. So, okay. Um, we're all literally just waiting to hear. Uh, and you strength and depth applied. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. No, um, like you, you said, we, we've built a lot of momentum over the last couple of years, and for me, it's we've just created a focal point for for the the UK community and the and the, the the European com community to come to, basically. And mm. there, there's no better way of you're never going to go and be around so many CrossFitters outside of a, a competition. Mm. And so, as you know, it was it was a privilege to be able to just bring that together and bring all those people together in one place. Hmm. Um, and so yeah we want to try and keep that momentum and keep delivering that experience i think without the without the prize of being a a, a, a qualification to the games it's going to be harder to attract the, the quality athletes and if you don't have the athletes today you're not going to attract the same sort of brands and 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 the same number of spectators so it becomes it becomes a much harder feat to really develop a quality event without that kind of carrot of of qualifying for the games. so um, but I've not, you know, I've not thought that far ahead yet. It's let's yeah. let's see how the dust settles with this semi-final stuff. Um, I think the difference now is uh, Dave, in particular, is is in, has been tasked with growing the sport outside of just the game season. And they've been very deliberate of making that game season very kind of condensed. Um, 
tight, yeah, condensed and tidied it up. So it's kind of March to July. That then leaves a massive off-season window to generate, you know, create more events. And obviously, what a Palooza have just announced that they're going to happen this year. But they, when they come back in January next year, um, they won't be a sanctioned event, but they hope to be a CrossFit event. And I think there are more opportunities like that now. Mm. What a Palooza are already an amazing established event before they're a sanctioned. Mm. Whereas at Strength and Depth, we were a decent event, twelve-person event. But actually being a sanctuary was the one that kind of put us on a pedestal. It also gave us the, I guess, give us the minerals to go out and actually try and deliver something bigger than we had done up until that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, if, if, we, if we're not selected, then we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board and figure out what we do with, with, with Sid. Um, and I'm sure there will be, there'll be multiple opportunities, you know, in years to come. But it, I, will be, I will be gutted because, uh, you know, I, I love CrossFit. It's given me a lot whether it's been coaching, competing, or in my, or my country manager role. And um, I'm just, I, I, I feel like it's a huge privilege and an honour to be able to give back to that sport and, and create that experience for people. So, mm. um, You mentioned there, like, so since Eric has taken over um, CrossFit, one of, the, one of the efforts, I suppose, that's been made is to re-energise that kind of country manager role, like we saw, you know, Paul in Canada who was obviously picked purely off um appearing on this show um <laughs> so you're you're um you're the UK manager and you've been recently taken Ireland in as part of that designation um like what's the day-to-day of your role or what like if you could list out you know like some of the larger responsibilities that fall under your umbrella yeah good question and it's something that we're refining and changing very quickly at the moment I think one of your children is being murdered there <laughs> yeah can you hear that sorry mate <laughs> usually murdering each other um, or being murdered by my wife um yeah no um and I always i'm always like can people hear that is that is that you know you can definitely hear it <laughs> yeah and your dog as well yeah sorry mate um, <laughs> I, know, I, I don't care am i joking of, uh, sorry i told you the sound of your dog shit yeah um yeah no so uh my, my role day to day is changing very quickly at the moment um you know is that hard like would you rather would you rather it was like set in stone before anything was announced like is it difficult with the kind of ground shifting under you a little bit when you're like oh i have to do that now as well and i don't have to do that thing anymore yeah no it's it's um i think the best way to describe it is exciting to be honest it's challenging Mm. it's exciting to be honest greg was very um just his style of leadership and just his philosophy was just very hands-off and that was his expectation of us as well to be very hands off with the affiliates and not meddle in and not be telling them how to run their affiliates and what they should be doing. Mm. Um, and just be there as a point of contact really and some support. So if they need something action very quickly, they could contact me, obviously, um, you know, I'm local, they can pick up the phone. It's much easier than trying to sync with somebody in the, in the States. Um, whereas now there's a lot more responsibility on me and a lot more accountability to help CrossFit grow in this part of the world and help it flourish all the while continuing to be more proactive when supporting the, uh, the affiliates. I think that that's the key difference is before we were very reactive in our role and we would just manage stuff as it came into us. Um, whereas now we're, we're planning and building proficiencies in our role so that we can be a lot more proactive. Really it's not like you you reaching out to affiliates and checking in with them rather than wait until they have an issue like yeah i mean we were doing that before but it's it, now it's much easier um to to do that on the front foot rather than on the back foot if that makes mm. sense um, does it make um like does the geography of it make your role difficult because obviously the uk and ireland are separate like islands um and then with brexit and everything like is that something that you're maybe apprehensive of the fact that um there is a checkered past between ireland and the uk anyway so then there might be some people that are like not happy about the fact that the country manager for ireland is someone from england and based in england yeah no 100 percent. i mean that was a, was a big reluctance when when i it was first presented to me i mean ultimately i've been doing a role in the uk for the last couple of years and you know ireland just been completely neglected um and there was no point of contact or no one to reach out to and and what we've seen is in those countries where there wasn't a country manager like canada like australia um, and ireland as an example there was a huge amount of resentment because it was 
there was no one to just kind of gather everyone together and be a point of contact and, and let people kind of vent to as well and just get their frustrations out when everything happened with um, with, with Greg's tweet, etc. Um, and so, so we felt that in Ireland massively, like there was just a massive void. Um, but there's only there's less there's like seventy affiliates in um, Ireland, whereas in the UK there's six hundred. So there's only there's there's only country managers in regions where there's so many mm. affiliates basically. Um, but it didn't make sense that Ireland just didn't have a representative. Mm. You know, a, they've been great ambassadors for for CrossFit and Jamie and Darina at, at the Filthy have done a great job of kind of taking that baton on. Um, but it did feel like it needed somebody official from CrossFit just to be a point of contact more than anything. Mm. Um, it's interesting because someone said, like, someone asked, a couple of people asked that, like, you know, about, you know, when I said I was talking to the, the, the UK and Ireland manager and they were like, who are they? And I was like, oh, it's one, like, it's one person is doing both. And then they were like, well, how is that going to work? And I was like, well, I mean, Paul Tremblay has a fair bit of extra ground to cover there <laughs> with Canada from like east to west coast is a lot of a larger geographical scope. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I suppose it's just the history, like, you know, um, would probably cause maybe some people an issue. But I think, like you say, it's something, and I think you, you alluded to it earlier on as well, when you said that the, you know, it creates a vacuum and a vacuum tends to be filled. So if there's nobody representing um ireland um either on site or off site it, it just creates this void that needs to be filled by something and it's probably going to be filled by people getting pissed off and having gripes and having no one to it might be as simple as i know sometimes i get pissed off and if i just talk to my wife about it it's gone and i'm like john you know actually i was you know probably wasn't right there or whatever <laughs> whereas like if i've no one to talk to i'll just keep building it up bigger and bigger and it'll just get yeah. worse yeah. um like you know, obviously the the change in CAO um, it will lead to certain shifts and changes, I suppose. Like, what are the changes that, say, you've noticed having held a similar, or if not the same role under both regimes? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just go back to your point, um, Pete, uh, about your, just about the, I guess the, the dynamic between having, having like a, an Englishman, uh, a Brit, <laughs> Um, representing the Irish affiliates. So if you, and you look at some of the other country managers like Ed in, in Australia, he's looking after New Zealand as well. Um, Mac in Germany is Aus Austria. Um, uh, he's looking after Austria and Switzerland as well. Ricardinho in Brazil is looking after South America. So I guess the country manager role isn't necessarily uh, representative of a, a country. It's more of a region, mm. per se. And when I, when, I, when I initially introduced myself to the Irish affiliates, you know, what I was very, I was very conscious of the fact that there was a brick coming in over there, and uh, you know, my goal further down the line, and we're trying to figure out what this looks like, is to have a, a representative in Ireland that knows the culture, knows the community far better than I ever will do, um, and it's just for me, I'm just understanding the lay of land at the moment, and and speaking to as many people as I possibly can, um, but also trying to identify who the key players are, who the who are the important people that. You, you, we can have representative and have representation in Ireland from an authentic, from a place of authenticity, basically. Mm. Um, and that might not be a country manager, but it can be a representative in that country. Um, and that's what we're trying to define what, what that looks like now. Because cross at the moment, you know, there's 150 countries they're doing CrossFit. You're not going to have a country manager in every one, particularly the ones with smaller, mm. more smaller affiliate representation. But you still need an ambassador. You still need a point of contact. I think. Mm. Um, just because you, you you don't know you don't understand the culture you don't understand the the dynamics in in those places so mm. um, and you can't cover you can only cover so much ground right you know, and um, so yeah I just, I just wanted to go back to that point just because I think it's a really important one particularly um, you know I should imagine a huge amount of your listeners are are Irish so um, yeah it's actually less than I thought <laughs> <laughs> is that a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. I haven't worked it out yet. <laughs> um, it just means my mom has stopped listening, I think. Yeah. Um, but no, to, back to your question about the regime. So um, Regime might be a strong word to use <laughs> in, in hindsight. Maybe I could have picked a better one. <laughs> you said that, not me. Yeah. Um, I guess um, Eric's just very more, a much more ambitious, I think. And uh, Greg was, again, he was very hands-off, happy to let it just play out organically basically 
Um, whereas, whereas Eric's a lot more proactive and really wants to intently grow CrossFit and expand CrossFit um, and professionalize it in certain areas, etc. So, um, and, and just pump a little bit more resource into it. And uh, yeah, so that's the key difference. And I think it's a little bit more you know, where Greg was very hands off, it's like what we're trying to do now is try and draw draw a new line in the sand of how much support we can give affiliates. First of yeah. all, um, like I was going to say, like under Greg, I know that, you know, affiliates were largely left to just do run, operate however they want, like which I suppose you have to respect the freedom that's given there. Like you don't want to own a gym and be told, no, you have to do classes at this time or whatever, like that would be ridiculous. But there's also an argument of like, you know all these affiliates are paying an annual fee and they're encouraging their members to take part in the sport and to do the open and all you know engage the community and grow it and promote it in the locality and stuff so i suppose you would hope that while there's freedom to own and operate your own business in your own way that there would also be you know safety nets and supports and advice systems that are freely available and like you know are um easy to access i suppose yeah no 100 percent. i mean there's there's such a a breadth and depth of talented people in this community um and it just seems crazy that we wouldn't pull those resources and aggregate them into one place and 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 find a, a way of disseminating that particularly you know, the way we're looking at affiliates now and the discussions that we're having at the moment is you've kind of got three free buckets you've got you know an affiliate brand new um very raw there's lots for them to learn it's a steep learning curve when you open your when you open your affiliate but there's there's people that have owned a gym for 10 years that if you could share that advice with them in the beginning it saves them a whole load of heartache and, mm. and time so um so what, what what are the resources that we do to help them and uh, then there's like once you've established yourself and you, you you're rocking and rolling how do we then get you to maximize your your facility and really grow and flourish as an affiliate owner and then after that it's like okay how do you expand from that so what are the additional programs you add to your affiliate do you think about opening up another location um, what are the other things that you can revenue streams that you can add to your to your business that can uh, you know, benefit you basically? And and so they're pop- they're, yeah. they're like manifesting themselves as like webinars now, kind of, isn't it? I know you got um, Daniel is doing one, you know, like general advice, I suppose, and co- common pitfalls, I suppose, like share, sharing that information, I guess. Yeah, and that's just the start. I mean, we were discouraged to do that. We were discouraged to bring everyone together and 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 have these sort of conversations. So you know i'm just doing it off my own back just to be proactive and and give some value to the affiliates but it will be much more standardized and formalized over time um they're in a meeting next next month in boulder about what it looks like and they're bringing a lot of experts together to really contribute to this i guess what we're calling affiliate playbook Um, and for me it really does start with the affiliate owner because you have a a healthy happy um affiliate owner the the affiliate's Mm. going to be thriving you're going to have more members you're going to have more people and engaging in CrossFit, it's going to generate more coaches. You're going to have more people doing the open. It's just going to grow the whole ecosystem. But you've got to look after the affiliate owner first and foremost because they're the one that, that that needs the support, basically. Did you say that you were discouraged from doing it? Yeah, we 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 were we were then told told to wait. Kind of is it? Well, no, we were just told not to. I mean, we, we didn't want to be. A, we were told not to. I mean, things like emails. Like, it didn't like us doing mass emails because it was informal and okay. it's, it's just a it's just difference of opinion more than anything yeah, yeah. different business philosophy and way it was it was growing whereas it's a lot more yeah like i said it's a lot more official now and a lot more standardized and um less organic i guess so yeah there's clearly like been more efforts made to i suppose have clear lines of communication from hq like instagram and facebook and stuff they're actually like you know they're utilizing them a bit more and they seem a bit more like human and a bit more kind of open um there's more engagement and there's i suppose more of a, sh- a spotlight being shown in the community as well especially like during the games most recently like the the ads and stuff that they had up were a lot more accessible than maybe some of the previous ads that they would have shared um like so far publicly i suppose the m- most changes have taken place in the competitive environment like you've got you know the rafting changes the games um you know aimed at i suppose making the open more accessible given the global bucket of shit that we have um and then moving back towards the kind of funneling system that they used to have and then the inclusive approach with the quarterfinals and then the last chance event and then the inclusion of the adaptive athletes i suppose on the other side then um you know there's been a big push on the country managers like yourself and they've spoken about inclusion panels being set up and 
I know I've heard Eric speak about affiliates coming back who had de-affiliated in the past. Um, like, do you think that there's enough being done um, or are there other avenues of improvement that haven't been explored? Because like, it seems a lot of the focus is on competition and like the, the, the competitive sport of CrossFit. And I think, you know, I empathize with people. I can kind of see both sides of it where if you want change, like, you need, you know, you need to be patient and you need to do things the right way once rather than, you know, like change, chopping and changing five different times when the first one doesn't work because you rushed it or whatever. Yeah. But I also empathize with people who are like, how long does it fucking take? Like, you know, we have these boards being set up and panels being set up and no information being given on, you know, what the timeline is going to look like or how long are we talking or, you know, what's the aim of the panel, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no, good question. I think with the game stuff, it's, it's just... Um... It's talked about a lot more prominently, isn't it? You know, it's uh, as fans of the sport, uh, you know, it's it gets a lot of media attention. So um, it probably feels like more is being done there. But also, you know, Dave and Justin, the games team, have have been kind of planning this for 15 years. Let's let, let's be honest, the rug was pulled under their feet for the last two years, and it wasn't really what they wanted to be doing. And they've never been given kind of full. Um, for responsibility to run the games how they think is the right way to do it. And Eric's definitely had some input in there and made them think slightly differently. Sanctuals over the last two years definitely made them think differently. And they've kind of created this hybrid that they're trying to roll out now. Now, the, you know, the the open starting pretty soon. And so they, um, you know, they have to work fast and get this stuff out. But like for me, like we still don't know what the semi-final is. So there's still stuff to be mm-hmm. ironed out and worked out basically. Um and it's the same from um I guess from the, the I mean the training department they pivoted greatly. They've they've had to go and develop online level ones and that type of stuff. So but there's not a huge talking point around that. Like it's not like you know you can't write Mon Chalk Up aren't going to write a lot of stories about that. It's like one article and then you know so, um, and then from the affiliation perspective, it's a case of just supporting the affiliates. And, and, and at the moment, we're just trying to be there to support everyone and get them to the other side of COVID. Mm. Um, because until then, there's nothing we can really do proactively. So, and we're using this time just to refine and develop and, and get things in place. But also, all these things cost money as well. And so, it's, you know, as, they, as, they, as Eric and the, the board kind of have been able to, they've you know, really had to, I think the games team have lived and breathed this. They've not really changed that much. The training team haven't really changed that much, but just from, as, uh, from a strategically as a business, you know, the, Eric and the, and the team are relatively new to this. So they've just done a huge reconnaissance kind of exercise and gathered as much information. And now it's kind of, Right, what are the what are the key things we really need to focus on and go after? Because mm. there's so much opportunity in CrossFit, and it's you know it's like that's the hardest things. Like really, where do you start? And they really kind of listen to us and and understand that actually really starts at the affiliate. So a lot of resources will go to the affiliate first and foremost. Like I said, it's about getting through COVID, but then once we come out of COVID, how do we then help gyms get back on on the front foot? How do mm. we help them thrive? And then we can start looking at other things. Yeah, I was gonna ask like obviously COVID has had a huge impact on affiliates all over the world with governments I suppose ordering their closure either temporarily or prolonged or you know opening closing opening closing like there's I suppose been a lot of sacrifices made by owners and members to to make things work like people renting equipment and training at home and people willing to rent out their equipment and risk it like by giving it to people to train at home and there's been a lot of efforts made by companies like I know you know fundraising events like O2 in the US or you know, they're doing great efforts to kind of give money back to affiliates and stuff if you keep your membership on and, you know, loud and live to the competition. At the start, CrossFit did one themselves to support your local box. And, you know, there's fundraising initiatives like the the part of the Solution T-shirts popping up most recently. Like, has CrossFit itself, um, like the company, got any plans, like, to financially aid affiliates, um, say, that could be teetering on the edge now? Or, you know, obviously there's a lot of ones that have closed their doors permanently already has crossfit like has it yet or is it planning on reaching out to those former owners that you're aware of you know well that's our responsibility as country managers really is to reach out to these people and work with people in 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 local countries to understand their position and and it really is a case-by-case basis based Mm. on certain circumstances some people have been um you know have been able to make the most of various grant government grants etc their employment status might mean that they've got kind of furlough funding and stuff. Others have had zero. 
So we're just trying to work with people on a case by case basis and whether it's kind of relief through affiliates fees or anything that we can do really that, um, you know, just help support people through it at the end of the day without yeah. kind of just saying, hey, nobody pays and, you know, CrossFit doesn't make any money themselves. Um, and then from fundraising efforts, yeah, we did uh, support your, your local box. Um, but, you know, part of the solution, like, like you uh, pointed out, the T-shirt stuff and doing stuff in country, we're doing some stuff with WIT to help raise some money through their classes, et cetera. Um, we're going to hopefully do an auction as well. Um, so there's things that we, we can do, but, it, you know, they're, they're a proud bunch of affiliate owners. And so they're not very forthcoming in saying they're struggling and they need support. So um, my life would be easier if those ones that really are struggling do need support could, you know, reach out to me because we're more than willing to help. We just need to know, know, know who you are and, and how to help them basically. Mm. Um, if there's a gym owner now somewhere in Ireland or the UK um, who's considering joining as an affiliate, what can you offer like as inspiration, I suppose, to, you know, push them over the fence? Yeah. But to, to, so they're a gym owner, but they want to become an affiliate. Yeah. They're considering it. Like what, what advice would you give or what, what insight would you give as to what, how they could benefit if they did affiliate? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, you have to, you have to love CrossFit, you know, it has to come from a place of authenticity. And there's a, there's a, a certain sense of nostalgia there. Um, with CrossFit, you know, CrossFit changed my life and, and it sounds like such a cliche, but all I wanted to do was own a gym after that because of my experience. And so you kind of need to be come, come at it from that kind of position rather than see it as like a, rather than see it as like a business proposition or something like that. Um, and then, you know, ultimately you, you, you're, you're joining a collective of 14,000 gyms around the world that have your back, you know, will support you, can share best practices. Um, and be part of something bigger than just yourself. So that's a big thing for me. And then, you know, fundamentally, you get to use the CrossFit brand, which even after everything that's happened this year is hugely valuable. And for, if you you know, take Bath as an example, there's lots of functional fitness gyms and stuff in, in, in our area, but we put CrossFit front and center loud and proud because there are, there are a huge proportion of people that are starting to learn about CrossFit and know about CrossFit and they want to do CrossFit in Bath, they're going to come to my gym. You know? and uh, i think there's a there's an obligation there um you know if you're doing the methodology and you're calling your workouts wads and you're doing the girls workouts and you know there's a certain obligation to be an affiliate you don't have to um but you're kind of you know you're not doing it authentic you know, authentically if you're if you're doing crossfit but you're not a crossfit basically um, mm. i heard you break it down before as like about 180 euro a month or somewhere around that ballpark yeah it's 180 yeah. 180, 180 pounds uh, a month so you, you need in some places one member some places two members some places three members to justify that fee mm. a month you know so no it's a no-brainer for me but don't see it as a people shouldn't see it as a business proposition it makes sense from a business proposition for me personally um but you have to love the brand and want to be part of the global you know community and want to get involved with um things like the open um but also i think that's something that i feel quite passionate about that you know what are the resources that we can give affiliates to help them thrive and do even better and that's something that we can add but that's you know to your point they're just words at the moment we need to start acting on those mm. and we need to start implementing those so yeah um one thing you could do that would probably be easy enough um i was at this is my second time asking a crossfit employee about this um, I was at Regions in Berlin and there was a CrossFit shop at the front and they had posters like, you know, like meet the girls and all the workouts and stuff don't exist anymore. Bring them back. Bring back like the CrossFit website store because yeah. I just yeah. I basically want to buy one of those posters and I can't get anywhere. So that's yeah, no, that's, exactly. that's one thing you can do. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, no, the store is amazing. I, I remember I, I, I've got like a picture on my Facebook from like, 11 years ago i'm like out out on the piss with a crossfit t-shirt on like <laughs> or like what is like a badge of honor yeah. and i ordered that from the store back in the day um yeah there's, no, there's think, an there's an immediate revenue stream for the company that can be yeah, well, they, they got rid of the greg wanted to get rid of the store he wanted to stop selling dog leads and all that sort of stuff he just felt like it was a distraction um and actually wit we're going to take it on so wit we're going to take on the store and they actually have quite a bit of inventory um but then everything happened and that kind of the brakes got put on that. 
Um, but I think that they 100% will be reigniting the, the store um, in some shape or form. We're just waiting to hear who will do it, who will deliver it in that. So um, Cool. If they want to store any stuff at my house. To, yeah. To <laughs> um, well, look, we'll finish with a quick fire. Um, so coach or compete? Coach. Um, Americano or flat white? Americano. A snatch or clean? Clean. Um, team or individual? Team. Uh, thrusters or burpees? Thrusters. Bath or shower? <laughs> shower i laughed so much when i wrote that question i just thought it was so funny i was like where's he from i was like bath yeah bath or shower i, I just laughed I can't remember the last time i had a bath yeah um but look thanks a million um for coming on uh i, I really appreciate you taking that time i know you're busy um i think you know like we say it, it's it's easy to to say all this stuff is going to happen so i think it's nice for for people to be able to put a face and a voice to who's represented them and for people like wherever they are listening to know what the role of a country manager is so that if, if they have an issue that they can approach, if it's not you, they can approach, you know, Paul, or I know there's, there's, there's a, you know, smaller management areas in the U S like that they can approach whoever their local rep is. I think it's an important, uh, it's important liaison to have, to have that capability to just reach out to someone rather than writing an email to HQ and maybe never getting a response because there's so many coming in. So I, I think I'm hopeful. I was hopeful already with Eric taking over and the changes and stuff that were talked about. Um, I'll admit to kind of maybe losing hope a little bit when I was kind of like, nothing's really happening. Like there's a lot of talk and nothing's happening. So I think I'm, I'm, I've got my, my hope has been reinvigorated talking to you that I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, things will continue to improve and continue to grow and progress. Um, so if anyone has any issues, then what's, what's the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, just email me, ollie.mansbridge at crossfit.com. Simple. Um, you know, it's, uh, I'm here to serve the community. I, I, don't, I don't see myself as a representative of CrossFit HQ. I see myself as a representative of the affiliates. Hmm. Um, and I'm, I, I, I fight on behalf of the affiliates, basically. And so if they're aggrieved and stuff's not getting done, it's my job to pass it up the chain and, and fight for it, basically. And that's, that's you know, what motivates me and why I enjoy this role so much. And it, it is tough at times, but hugely rewarding as well to, to actually be able to contribute at, to, to the development of, of CrossFit and, and help it grow and, and support the affiliate owners and help them thrive. Um, in their own businesses is, uh, yeah, it's, like I said, hugely rewarding. So um, I'm, I'm an advocate for them rather than a, an HQ employee, basically. Very good. Um, look, thanks, man. Enjoy the rest of your day. Appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. Thanks.